You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on the feast of St. Martin of Tours. Not to be confused with Blessed Martin de Pours, whose feast day we celebrated last week on November 3rd. This St. Martin's feast day reaches back 12 centuries before our Peruvian Dominican and takes us across the seas to the ranks of the Roman army. This feast day has marked such a milestone on the Catholic calendar through the ages that it's merited its own special title. Like Candlemas and Christmas, today's feast day is still known in many places as Martinmas. As you might have guessed, given this fact, St. Martin, who was a 4th century bishop, enjoyed particular fame during the medieval ages, similar to the 14 holy helpers. And for good reason did he earn his following. On the cutting edge of Christianizing the world, St. Martin was well known as an early warrior for the church. Dom Garanger in the liturgical year tells us, St. Martin's mission was to complete the destruction of paganism, which had been driven from the towns by the martyrs, but remained up to his time master of vast territories removed from the influence of the cities. St. Martin of Tours preached the word of God throughout Gaul. In all its provinces, he overthrew the idols one after another, reduced the statues to powder, burnt or demolished all the temples, destroyed the sacred groves and all the haunts of idolatry. Martin, consumed with zeal for the house of God, was obeying none but the Spirit of God. Against the fury of the pagan population, Martin's only arms were the miracles he wrought, the visible assistance of the angels sometimes granted to him, and above all the prayers and tears he poured out before God when the hard-heartedness of the people resisted the means by which Martin changed the face of the country. Where he found scarcely a Christian on his arrival, he left scarcely an infidel at his departure. The temples of the idols were immediately replaced by temples of the true God. For says Sopulcius Severus, as soon as he had destroyed the houses of superstition, he built churches and monasteries. It is thus that all Europe is covered with sanctuaries bearing the name of St. Martin. End quote. Christendom owes a lot to the work of St. Martin, Bishop of Tours. He was a scourge of heretics, successfully fighting against the Arian and Priscillian heresies. He founded the oldest existing abbey in Europe, the Benedictine Abbey of Le Gouge in Poitiers, as well as the Abbey of Marmotier in Tours, one of the largest and most influential establishments in medieval Europe, which flourished until the destruction of the French Revolution. St. Martin was among the first in the history of Christianity to introduce a rudimentary parish system, which effectively extended the reach of Christianity away from city centers for the first time. As bishop, he made the rounds once a year, traveling amongst all his parishes, just as our bishops do today when they travel from church to church, bringing us the sacrament of confirmation. We know many of the details of such an early saint, thanks to the writings of his contemporary, Sopulcia Severus, a Christian who knew St. Martin personally, and who understood the importance of documenting the life and times of the church leaders, something we should keep in mind today. The labors of our religious are no less inspiring and important now than they were in the 400s. Recording the stories of their labors is a service to Catholicism, now and in the future. St. Martin of Tours' biography cannot be told without the famous story of the cloak, which allows us to take a peek at the character of this holy man. So in context of his life story, St. Martin was born in the year 316 in the city of Siberia, Hungary now, but at that time a Roman province. The son of non-Christians, his father was a respected officer in the Roman army, and though Christianity was no longer outlawed, his father had little use for the upstart religion. In his mind, it was beneath the honor of his status. Because of this status, though, Martin was raised amongst a household of servants, who it turns out were Christians. 
Their example of goodness and charity, in contrast with what he saw exemplified amongst the pagans, so impressed young Martin that he began to consider converting to Christianity in his early teens. About the time he was 15 years old, his father discovered this interest, and believing that his son would abandon such folly if he were forced to encounter the realities of the world, he enlisted young Martin into the army. For three years, Martin traveled throughout Gaul, present-day France, with the army, conspicuous for what fellow soldiers later recounted to Sulpicius, an uncommonly clean mouth, and a particular attention to integrity, peculiarities that were generally overlooked in view of the unusual air of authority and presence the young man also commanded. During this time, probably at the very end of these three years, while Martin still wore the insignia of Rome, he received his marching orders from God. It was during the bitter cold of winter 335 that Martin, attached to the elite bodyguard of the emperor, found himself outside the walls of Ambianum, now known as Amiens, working some reconnaissance and advanced preparation of a royal visit to the city, or so it has been theorized by some historians and embellished by yours truly. Word of the city's impoverished conditions had reached the ears of the liaison officer, and so Martin had been dispatched at the crack of dawn to discover the least inoffensive route to the town center. Martin wondered when, or if, his king would openly adopt the faith his mother, Queen Helen, so courageously practiced in spite of the snobbery at court. If Helen were going to be in the royal parade, Martin would purposely divert the entourage through the poorest part of the city, knowing that her charity would make the risk worthwhile, and the people of Amiens would benefit. He wasn't as sure of Constantine, however, and would not inadvertently risk his royal disgust coming down on the heads of the poor of the city. Bending his head as he passed under the gate into Amiens, Martin asked God's blessing on the people therein, and for the thousandth time he prayed for the soul and the Christian discretion of Constantine. God's kingdom would reign regardless of earthly kingdoms, but an earthly king held in his power to bless his people by putting God's kingdom over his own. With a deep, hopeful breath, Martin lifted his chin. The shivering sunshine had just shrugged over the horizon. His mount snorted, blowing out a cloud of steam in the frigid, still air. Patting the horse's withers in sympathy, Martin drew his thick wool cloak tighter in front of him. Best keep moving, he told the mare, lest your hooves freeze to the cobblestones. A rooster crowed, piercing the echo of his voice. The only other sound, his horse's hooves. All of the doors and windows of hovel and homes were shuttered. Thin wisps of smoke hovering above the thatched rooftops seemed frozen against the sky. Not a soul stirred. Or maybe not a soul, but something rustled and shifted in a pile of half-rotted leaves and debris that had collected against the wall of a tumble-down shack near the road. A rat, Martin wondered, turning his head to look more closely as he passed. Soul or no soul, in this bitter cold he could feel sorry even for a a what? The thought hung in the air as his mount startled and shifted its feet nervously. It was no rat. Martin drew in his breath. From out of the debris, a filthy gnarled hand was raised, and a thready voice, almost indistinguishable, breathed out the one word, help. In an instant, Martin leapt from his horse, full of remorse for his unworthy thoughts, but had he known? Well, certainly he hadn't known. Reins in one hand, he hastened to the poor beggar, using his free hand to dig him out of his filthy blanket of leaves. And there he was, revealed in all his misery, the poor man. Curled into a ball so small his knees were near his ears, his bones seemed barely held together by the covering of his dirty skin, all too much of which showed through a ragged conglomeration of patches held together with holes. Martin was at a loss for words. What was there to say? So he did what seemed the only thing to do. He unhooked his cloak and with one movement shifted it from his shoulders to cover the beggar at his feet. Crouching, he pulled it around and prepared to tuck it under the man's chin until he was stopped. 
By the calm look of perception in the liquid brown of the man's eyes, such an unexpected expression, Martin stopped just short of asking, Do I know you? And smoothing his cloak over the man's bony back, asked instead, Better now? The old man, still watching Martin with his placid gaze, said, Doubly warm and twice what I need. Let us share it. It took the young soldier a moment to understand his meaning. Standing hesitantly, he went to his saddle, secured his horse, and looked back at the beggar, a question in his eyes, and drew out his sword. The old man, pushing to a sitting position, nodded, and in less than a moment, Martin had split the crimson cloak in two. He wrapped one half around the beggar, and it was indeed more than enough to cover him completely, and the other half he draped sideways across his own shoulders, glad for the wisdom of the compromise. Digging in his belt, he found his last coin to give the man, and knowing he could do no more, Martin bid him adieu and continued on his way. That night, our Lord appeared to Martin in a dream, wearing around his shoulders the half-cloak he'd given the beggar. Christ smiled at the young officer. Do you recognize this? he asked, indicating the rough red wool of the garment. Not waiting for Martin's answer, our Lord turned to the host of shining angels accompanying him and said, Martin, though only a catechumen, hath clothed me with this garment. The story goes on that he was baptized shortly thereafter, but it wasn't until he was engaged with the army on a campaign in present-day Germany two years later that Martin realized he could no longer fight for Rome, but needed to follow his religious calling. When he was jailed for cowardice for refusing to participate in the upcoming battle of Borbatamagus, which is present-day Worms, Martin proposed to march unarmed at the head of the troops. But there was no need. The opposing army surrendered, the battle never occurred, and Martin was allowed to surrender his commission, free to fight for God and his church. And the rest is history. St. Martin was ordained a priest, and after numerous adventures, including a stint as a holy hermit, he went on to be consecrated the third bishop of Tours, France, against his own inclinations, which is always a good sign, isn't it? It's said that St. Martin was so reluctant to be raised to the elevation of a bishop that he had to be tricked into it. The story goes that he was lured away from his abbey into the city of Tours with a story that he was needed to minister to someone in the town who was sick. But uh, that subterfuge wasn't going to work long before things got awkward, was it? Once St. Martin got wind of the real goings-on, it's said that he hid in a barn full of geese. But the cackling of the geese gave away his hiding place, and filled with the humble acceptance of God's will, he allowed the crowd to lead him to the church where he was forthwith consecrated. This legend explains why it has been customary in some places through the ages to eat goose on the Feast of Martinmas, and while you'll sometimes see geese represented in his iconography. St. Martin died on November 8, 397, at the venerable age of 80 years. Regarded as a saint during his own day, due not only to his life of prayer and sacrifice, but to the high proliferation of miracles that God was pleased to work through St. Martin, his immediate cultus was inevitable. He is one of the ancient names listed in the Roman Martyrology. St. Martin's tomb has been one of the highly popular sites of pilgrimage throughout the ages, and for the same reasons it's drawn the faithful, it has also been the target of persecution against the church through a millennium and a half. The Basilica of St. Martin in Tours was raided in turn by the Viking barbarians in 996, the Protestant Huguenots in 1562, and the anarchists of the French Revolution in 1802. From amidst the rubble left by the French revolutionists, the tomb of St. Martin was finally uncovered again in 1860, and a new tomb was constructed within a new basilica that was built on the ancient site. Begun in 1886 and consecrated in 1925, it helped heal the chasm between church and state started by the French Revolution. 
At the close of World War I, the French people, having rediscovered their devotion to their ancient patron, saw it as St. Martin's direct intercession in the affairs of France when the armistice was signed on St. Martin's Day on the 11th of November, 1918. From the 4th century through the late Middle Ages, the Feast of St. Martin began the 40-day period of fasting previous to the Feast of Christmas. Similar to the custom of Lent, the Eve of St. Martin was in former days a day of feasting and revelry, parallel to Shrove Tuesday today. It wasn't until the 11th century that Pope St. Gregory VII shortened the period of preparation before Christmas from the 40 days of Martinmas to our modern-day Advent time period of four Sundays. During the Middle Ages, St. Martin's cloak, called the Capa Sancti Martini, was preserved at the Marmouche Abbey near Tours. One of the most sacred relics of the French kings, it was carried everywhere the king went in those early days, even into battle, and was a holy relic upon which oaths were sworn. Interestingly, if you're into etymology, the priest who cared for the cloak in its reliquary was called a Capel Anu, and ultimately all priests who served the military were called Capelani, the French translation of which is Chapelan, from which our English word chaplain is derived. Similarly, the small temporary churches that were necessarily built for the relic as it traveled about with the French kings were called capella, the word for little cloak. This eventually translated to our word for small churches, chapels. Though the origin of the legend is unknown, it's believed that St. Martin had a hand in the early spread of winemaking throughout the Touraine region of France by encouraging the sharing of vines amongst Catholic wine growers in his parishes. In some legends, it was St. Martin who first discovered the method of pruning vines for a better harvest by observing the good results of a crop being pruned by nibbling goats. St. Martin is especially connected with the Chanin Blanc grapes, so if you are a white wine person, St. Martin is your guy. And a few more around the world facts of our feast day. If you remember the podcast last St. Patrick's Day, you might remember the surprising connection between these two of our most famous saints. St. Martin, according to some historians, was St. Patrick's uncle. And during St. Patrick's time on the mainland when studying for the priesthood, he spent at least part of his time at St. Martin's Abbey at Marmoutier. So, naturally, the Irish feel a special kinship with St. Martin. Among many Irish legends concerning today's saint, there's one from County Wexford that tells how the fishing boats of the town were out on the morning of 1 November 11th, when an apparition of St. Martin was seen walking on the waves. He admonished the fishermen to put their oars into the water and return to their harbors. All those who ignored his warning perished in a storm that came up in that afternoon. Since then, no Wexford boat would put out to sea on St. Martin's Day. Now, if anyone in Ireland knows whether Martinmas is still a fisherman's holiday in Wexford, let us know in the comments. In Flanders, parts of the Netherlands, and the Catholic areas of Germany and Austria, children to this day still participate in paper lantern processions in honor of St. Martin. Typically, a young man dressed as St. Martin rides on a horse in front of the procession of children carrying homemade paper lanterns. The children may present plays and sing songs about St. Martin, and traditional sweetbreads are distributed. This is an old Catholic custom I can personally vouch still exists. Last year, I got to experience a Martinmas celebration still lovingly preserved in Bavaria, where Kevin and his family live. My Martinmas this year can only suffer by comparison, let me tell you. In Portugal, on the Feast of St. Martin, families and friends gather around bonfires and celebrations called Magustos, where they roast chestnuts and adults drink a particular kind of wine called Jerapiga, and children drink aguape, which is basically grape juice. The Portuguese tradition of the Martinmas story provides us with a natural world phrase that you see many times over in classical poetry especially. St. Martin, in the Portuguese tradition, cut off half of his cloak in order to offer it to a beggar, and then later along the way he gave the second half to a second beggar.
Then, since he faced a long ride back to camp in freezing weather, God provided for the dark clouds to clear and the sun to shine so intensely that the frost melted away. To this day in Portugal, the phenomenon of a sunny break to the chilly weather on St. Martin's Day is therefore called St. Martin's Summer, and I am not even going to try to pronounce that in Portuguese. But if you look up St. Martin, and especially St. Martin's Summer under poetry, you'll find entries by classic poets like Robert Louis Stevenson, John Greenleaf Whittier, Robert Browning, and William Cullen Bryant. Well worth a peek, homeschool moms. Most of them are quite good, but just too long to read here. In America, the great melting pot, we can choose from among all these traditions to celebrate the day. It's a quick search to find St. Martin's sweet bread recipes or a tutorial for paper lanterns. At my season of life, I'm leaning a little toward the idea of toasted chestnuts and wine. Many families take the opportunity of Martinmas to present one another with the gift of new scarves and mittens. But perhaps the best way to recognize Martinmas after Mass and the Sacraments is to remember the story of the cloak and St. Martin's example of charity by donating to the needy in his honor. Bringing coats or blankets especially to homeless shelters or other charitable institutions today would be a particularly appropriate work of mercy. For the record, St. Martin of Tours is the patron saint of France, of beggars, of soldiers, of the Pontifical Swiss Guard, of geese and horses, of tailors and innkeepers, and of anyone in the winemaking industry. He is the patron saint against poverty and alcoholism. And to close, a prayer which is attributed to St. Martin of Tours and written at the end of his long life. Lord, if thy people still have need of my services, I will not avoid the toil. Thy will be done. I have fought the good fight. Yet if thou biddest me continue to hold the battle line in defense of thy camp, I will never beg to be excused from failing strength. I will do the work thou shalt entrust to me. Whilst thou command, I will fight beneath thy banner. Amen. St. Martin of Tours, pray for us. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.